<laughs> but thank you also for the chance to come and, uh, and be with everybody here. Um, and uh, I'd also like to congratulate uh, Dr. Monin, who's been doctor for 48 hours, um, or perhaps 47 <laughs> uh, right now. Um, so I wanted, what I wanted to do was to, um, coming out of some discussions over the last uh, few days, um, back up a little bit from what I was going to talk about and talk about the philosophical project that has led me to a variety of technical things, which maybe we could get into later or over dinner or whatever. Um, but this has been a long philosophical route. Um, it actually started in uh, October of 1967 when I was an undergraduate um, in the middle of the 60s, and I was a typical 60s college student in the United States. I was completely torn between politics and religion on the one side and staying up all night talking to friends on the one hand, and then also um, I was a physics and math major, and, uh, and those two parts of me ripped me apart. And uh, a computer was delivered. Um, they were brand new. There were no computer science then. Um, and I was interested in it. I was partly interested in AI, although I didn't even know the name, um, but also interested in what computers were, in particular, whether um, the computer could play a role in healing this gap between the part of me that was interested in complexity and politics and religion and so on on the one hand, and the kind of power and elegance and so on and so forth, which I saw in physics. Um, and in particular, with respect to the human condition, could you have an account of the human condition which would have some of the power of the sciences without being desiccating and reductionist and all of these kinds of things, which I thought scientific accounts historically had been. So that was my naive 16-year-old view. And uh, I started to... Uh, to program. I don't, did we end up, uh, Harry, with markers or not? Oh, yes, yes. Uh, um, I them somewhere. Well, it doesn't number really number matter. Number. No, it, you've got them. Okay. Brian. Yes. Slow down. Slow down? But I was speaking so slowly. <laughs> um, I thought the markers might help me slow down. So, um, um, so the first thing that was interesting, um, and and I think this is a serious point which, which Alexander's thesis and that work of others in this room illustrates, is that I started programming. I started hanging out in the uh, computer center. I had a girlfriend who had another boyfriend, and that was a great motivation for learning how to program. And what I learned was that the theories that were articulated about computation didn't match what it was that I felt like I was learning as a programmer. And with respect to AI, in particular cognitive science and so on, I think it's really in interesting. Um, if this is the mind, and this is computing, and if artificial intelligence or cognitive science is roughly that there's some equivalence between the mind and the computing, you know, mind is a kind of computer or something, the debates about this are not conducted at the level of the phenomenon. The debates are conducted in terms of a theory of the mind and a theory of computing. and then people write papers at this level. And there's lots and lots of papers about whether the mind is computational. And there's one theory of the mind, and then there's another one. Dreyfus criticizes um, Minsky and comes up with a different theory of the mind, and then Andy Clark comes up with a different theory of the mind, and there's all this contestation with respect to the theory of the mind. But I was concerned on this side of the equation because the theories of computing that they were comparing the theories of mind to didn't strike me as true of the computing that I was actually dealing with. So I wanted to know about this side of the picture, and I thought I would spend six weeks or something figuring out what computing was, and then if I understood what computing was for real, I could actually address this question which I wanted to spend my life on. And I've actually spent my whole life on this side of the question. The six weeks is barely over now. Um, and it turns out that this is interesting for many more reasons. It's much more interesting than I expect. Um, one thing that's interesting is that there isn't just one theory of computing. There's two, you know, there are a variety of different conceptions of computation out there. And a lot of people seem to think, oh, they're all equivalent partly because of a mathematical proof of equivalence in um, formal computer science. But the thing about the mathematical proof of equivalence in computer science is that it's so coarse grain that it runs roughshod over every philosophical distinction you could conceivably imagine. I mean, you know, uh, materialism and dualism and behaviorism and representationalism and all these kinds of stuff, that theory just obliterates. So if we're going to actually understand what the mind is like, we need to understand um, the theories in, in uh, 
in some difference. I'm just going to mention four, although there's more out there than, uh, than, than that. One idea is that computers are formal symbol manipulators. That's an idea that you read about in philosophy and in cognitive science and a little bit in AI. There's another theory which I'll call effective computability which is the theory of computing that deals with Turing machines and is the mathematical theory that computer scientists deal with. A lot of people assume these two are the same. I think they're radically different. Another idea is that um, computers are information processors. And information has become a hugely popular word. It's probably more popular than interdisciplinarity now. Um, so there's a question of whether what information is and do these things process information. And there's a question of what information has to do with either of these two. Um, and uh, there's a, an idea that computers are digital in some important sense, which it's sort of obvious that that doesn't exactly mean this, but people still sort of assume that and so on and so forth. So my first project was to try to understand, um, as I said, whether any of these theories was actually adequate to computation, and uh, um, and I just want to say the first substantive result is they're all wrong. They're just not one of them, I believe, is adequate to explaining computation, nor any combination. Um, now, in a, in, in, in before we're done, uh, I will answer some other questions, like what's right if those are wrong? <laughs> And if those are wrong, is that a negative result? I think the fact that they're wrong is actually interesting, but has a huge amount of positive stuff to it. Um, but, uh, but I will just claim that not one of those will do justice to the thing that I call computation in the wild, the actual fact that computational stuff has drenched society and has a lot of power in society and is changing the internet and, and changing people's ideas of themselves and so on and so forth. Um, Obviously, the ideas we have about computing are affecting computing, and what computing's actually like is affecting the imaginations, especially of young people, in ways that are related to the theories and so on and so forth. So if this were a summer-long seminar as opposed to a 40-minute talk, we would have to be more subtle and nuanced. But just to be blunt for today, I'm just going to say that they're wrong. And. Um, and I'm going to tell you why in a minute. But I want to make a couple of methodological points first, just two really. Um, because when I say that they're wrong, I tend to get two kinds of answers. One of them is, you're crazy. Now I get that a lot. <laughs> I get it a lot, especially from computer scientists who say, look, of course you're wrong. This is the right theory of computing because that's how computing is defined. Now I don't know what a definition is. I don't actually like definitions myself. But the interesting issue of authority in that is that people, and actually people say this for lots of different ones, they say that's how computing is defined. So the theoretical computer science will say it's defined to be the computation, the effective, the mathematical um, calculation of effective functions. There's huge problems with that characterization, which we could go into. Um, if you talk to philosophers, they say, it's defined as formal symbol manipulation. I remember talking to Fred Dretzky, a philosopher you may know of, about cognitive science. And I was saying, look, computation is not formal symbol manipulation. So therefore, whether the mind is a computer, he wrote a presidential address for the American Philosophical Society, arguing that computers can't add. And his idea that computers can't add was based on this conception. And I said, well, look, what if that conception was wrong? And then he said, well, then philosophy is not interested in computation. <laughs> They're only interested in the idea. They're not interested in the phenomenon. And that's the kind of thing I get from a lot of people who say the definitions are, um, have authority. I don't believe that. I actually think it's much more interesting to understand what actually happened historically, you know, starting maybe with Boole or, or uh, in the mid-19th century with the rise of information as a notion. Um, you know, Turing and all this kind of stuff and actually take an empirical stance. So I want to basically take an empirical stance and I will take AI and cognitive science to be ostensibly defined. I will say basically AI and cognitive science is the following thesis. 
that things like that are like things like <laughs> that. <laughs> and just, you know, everything else then depends on, um, you know, everything else is, it can be brought into question. Um, so that's one thing. People think they're defined. Another thing is that people think, well, look, what we build them, we must understand them. I think, I don't need to spend a lot of time on that, but that is clearly false. Um, we build, well, we build cash machines, you know, these machines that you can take uh, euros out of at the corner of the bank. I know how to build one of those, but that doesn't mean I understand money. Um, I have a nine-month way of building people. Um, it doesn't follow that I understand people if I use the nine-month way. A lot of people assume that the nine-month method is completely different from what it is that we do in the laboratory, and I don't know um, why they think that. Um, so I want to take this as an empirical phenomenon, and I want to take it as a non-transparent phenomenon. Um, so those are two methodological assumptions. A third methodological point is that a lot of people think, well, okay, maybe we'll give you the idea that the status of theory is problematic, but some things we know. At least we know these are machines. At least we know they're technology. At least we know they only do what we tell them to do. Now, I don't know who says they're machines. I've never seen anybody do a double-blind uh, empirical study to test whether a computer is a machine or not. I don't even know what it would be to do with such a study. This is basically a presupposition. Certainly nobody who has worked with computers for very long thinks that computers only do what you tell them to do. So that presupposition is manifestly, I think, false of practice for lots of reasons, having to do with complexity and learning and so on. Whether they're technology or machines, whether in particular they're the zenith of the mechanist philosophy stemming from the 17th century, are these things mechanical? That is to say, are they explanatorily accountable for in terms of being mechanisms? I don't want to assume an answer to that. And if you think about it, there's an astonishing fact about computer science, which is that all the technical terminology Words like symbols and data and interpretation and reference and identifier and name and syntax and so on, all the technical terminology comes from the interpretive discursive logic, you know, rationalist tradition, not from machinery and forces and pulleys and fluids and, and, and weight and so on and so forth. So that's a kind of just an interesting, very superficial observation, which is that's interesting. All of this stuff is being described using words which come from that part of our tradition that deals with texts and discourse and interpretation and semiotics and exegesis and hermeneutics and so on. And yet the things are actually built in, I just read this morning, in these fad lines. Um, this company in, um, in uh, China has just invested $17 billion to expand one factory. Um, you know, so there's a lot of mechanism there. What's the relationship between the mechanism and this discourse that comes from the interpretive discursive traditions? Um, so I don't want to buy that they're machines, and I don't think what anybody should, because suppose the MAT AI lab where I went to school constructed a device that was actually intelligent. Now you might say no machine. Suppose Alexander has argued that no machine can be intelligent, and MIT produces a machine. That is to say, MIT produces something in its AI lab which is intelligent. There are two possibilities. One is Alexandra was wrong. Sure enough, a machine can be intelligent. Another possibility is on the day when, in fact, they got this thing to be intelligent, it ceased to be a machine, and it became being, or Dasein, or something like that. Who knows? Who knows what baggage the word machine, technology, and so on and so forth brings with it? So I want to set that aside as well, that kind of set of obvious assumptions. So in sum, methodologically, I want to set aside presumptions, its definition. I want to make it empirical. And I don't even want to assume the broadest characterizations in terms of, of mechanism or machinery. Um, OK, so that's methodology. Then we need to look at these four accounts. Um, now, I'm going to tell you what's right later. But I'm going to tell you what's wrong first. And I'm going to tell you what's wrong in two stages, one in particular with respect to each account, and then, um, and also a little bit what's right in particular. And then also I'm going to say some remarks at the end about what's wrong in general with all of these, and what's right in general. And then I'll try to tell you what 
I think the right answer is. Um, formal symbol manipulation, which I will associate with formal logic, namely people who like to write letters rotated by 180 degrees. Um, I think there are two insights in this tradition, which interestingly enough have been almost entirely lost even in the logical tradition. So I have to go back to what I think logic actually meant at the beginning of the 20th century. Basically the following two things. One is that this is fundamentally a meaningful system. There's something like semantics this, or interpretation. Whatever your favorite word it is, a Brentano-esque arrow of directedness, there's issues of, of, of that. But it's essentially, I'm just going to use the word meaning. Issues of semantics are fundamental. The second point, I think, is that it has to be mechanically realized. We don't want to be Cartesian dualists about it. It has to be physically realized. And then the, the real insight is the following, I believe. The mechanism that you build is subject to norms that come from here that are not themselves mechanical. And I would actually summarize the entire sweep of 20th century logic uh, this was actually in the words of John Barwise, a, a friend of mine who was a, a, a world famous logician. Fundamentally, you cannot reduce semantics to syntax. That's basically what he took all of 20th century logic as a demonstration of. And I think the reasons are profound and metaphysical, basically, that semantics is not a local mechanical phenomenon. It has to do with relationships to the world at large. Syntax has to be mechanical. And these systems are mechanical systems that are constitutively governed by semantic non-local norms. That's what I think the insight is. Um, mechanism honoring semantic norms. That's, I think, a profound insight, which has almost entirely been lost in contemporary cognitive science. What's wrong with logic? Lots of things. One idea is that these are formal symbols. The idea that, this, that the way that intelligence arises is out of these particularly chunked symbols, you know, consisting just of predicates and relation symbols and terms and so on and so forth, the way logic does it. There's lots of evidence that the brain doesn't work that way, the mind doesn't work that way. Um, the idea that the syntax is independent of the semantics, which is one of the readings of this word formal, I think is also demonstrably false. Uh, Dreyfus's critique that the, ontologically the world is not, um, doesn't consist of objects chopped up in nice, um, it's not like God put white labels on all the objects and the tables and the properties in advance and so on and so forth, you just read them off, that's not the way the world is. Um, for example, the idea that all the symbols are inside the head and all this, the uh, semantical stuff is outside the head, um, also problematic. Um, the word formal is interesting because one of the things I did 20 years ago was I tried to survey the number of things formal means. So I talked to a lot of people. I talked to Freeman Dyson in physics about what formal means if you're a formal physicist. I talked to musicians. And you know, it's, it's everyone's sort of favorite non-formal word. And it can mean syntactic, or it can mean mathematical, or it can mean not really with any heart, heart and soul. My favorite definition or, uh, of formal was authorized in the sense that, so this is an American example, if you get a formal invitation to the White House, that means you actually get to go there. Um, I think the authorization behind the notion of formal is interesting. But anyway, there's a whole critique of formality we could actually spend a, an entire afternoon or summer on um, as to what it's doing. But I think the formality is wrong. I think all of those views of formality are wrong. So there's tons wrong with that account. But I think this idea, this is a big idea and a good one. What about effective computability, the theory of Turing machines and, uh, and all of that kind of stuff? I'm just going to say this. What's wrong about it is it doesn't deal in meaning at all. What I think it is, is a mathematical theory of causality. 
So this thing, I think, is the triumph of the philosophy of mechanism. But the problem with it is that what computer science is trying to do is to, in fact, advance the hegemony of a mechanist reduction of intentional phenomena by actually thinking that you can give this account of it. And then there's this wondrous historical point that, for a variety of reasons, that start out on page 7 of Turing's original 1937 article, all of this discourse that I mentioned before of signs and symbols and representation and, and names and all this kind of stuff gets picked up and put inside a mechanist framework. So now if I go to a computer science department, I talk about semantics, and I talk about meaning, and I talk about intentionality, and I talk about directedness, and I talk about truth, and I talk about reference, and I talk about consistency, and I talk about all these semantical phenomena, they say, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And they have mechanical interpretations of all of those words. So I've lost vocabulary with which to talk to people trained in computer science about what I think the real issues of meaning and representation, intentionality, world directedness, and, and so on and so forth are. So that's a kind of perverse situation in intellectual history at the moment that computer science has picked up all the rationalist vocabulary and dumped it inside mechanism. But I think when you clear all of that out, this is just a theory of bumping and shoving. It's just a mathematical theory of bumping and shoving. And the problem with that as a theory of computing is I don't think computing is just bumping and shoving because if it were, it would just be all machines. And so that's not going to be enough to capture what's going on with respect to the computation stuff. Um, what about information processing? This is certainly the most popular conception of computing in the newspapers. Well, as I say, information is um, a popular word these days. The problem is You know, and uh, Floridy goes around talking about the philosophy of information being this wonderful thing. I mean, he's, trying, he's a booster for philosophy of information. You know, uh, people are starting institutes everywhere. There's this uh, center for the theories of information and stuff. People are trying to make, you know, Gleick has this popular book called The Information. I don't know if it's in French yet. It probably will be if it's not. People are trying to make a huge deal out of the notion of information. I don't think Floridy's right. I mean, let alone the fact that he's sort of just a, pop, a popularizer. I don't think there's any reason to believe that these two phenomena are necessarily the same. I'm not saying they're orthogonal, but I don't think they're the same. If I come to you, Hector, I believe, is Alexander's um, young son, whom I met the other night. If I come to Alexander, so don't take this seriously, all right? And I say, <laughs> unfortunately, Hector was just hit by a bus and has been taken to the hospital seven uh, blocks down the street, and uh, he's in an emergency room, and he's on a heart machine. Alexander's not going to say, well, that's interesting. Seven bytes, you know, seven bits of information with error correction. I can put that in two bytes of code and all this kind of stuff. You know, that, that was an interesting amount of information you just gave me, right? <laughs> He's not going to talk to me at all. He's going to get out of here and fly over to the hospital because information in that sense, if I say I have information about his kid, is about something. So it's basically a, a, a semantic notion. And there's a huge uh, philosophical tradition, as, as many of you I'm sure know, starting with Stamp and Dretzky and Millikan and a lot of people in, uh, well, a lot of people in analytic philosophy are trying to use a notion of information which is semantic, which they're going to derive from evolution in order to construct a scientific account of semantics and, and normativity, and then they're going to get is out of ought, and that's part of the naturalization of, of ethics, basically. That's the kind of intellectual project they're part of. There's another notion which doesn't say what's the information about. It says how much. It's just a measured quantity. These are the people that tie information to heat. You know, loss of a bit of information is equivalent to one over Planck's constant or a certain amount of thermodynamic heat. Um, the, the Higgs boson, the God's particle that was recently discovered, communicates with other fermions and bosons by passing information and so on and so forth. There's this much information in the universe. How much in the universe can you pack it? How much information can you pack into a black hole? This is a pure quantitative measure. I went to a conference 20 years ago talking about this, the, the unification of quantum mechanics in it with the notion of information. And I put up my hand and I said, what about, um, I asked a, a speaker, I asked a question of the speaker. I said, what about 
what are you going to say about what information is about? And the speaker came to a complete halt. Someone in the audience stood up and said, about, that's a word for philosophers. Information is a scientific notion. It has nothing to do with aboutness. And there was a huge cheer in the, uh, in the audience. I think that's kind of indicative <laughs> that we maybe don't have exactly the same notion here. So, so first of all, the notion of information falls apart into more than one notion. Um, what's going on here? What's right about this? Oh, what's wrong with it? Well, first of all, I don't actually think computing is just information processing. If, if your computer messes up and doesn't get an email, it's not just information about your email that it didn't deliver. It actually didn't deliver the email itself. Right? Computers are actually causally engaged in the actual practices we're engaged in. They don't just process information about the practices we're engaged in. If they put up a window, they don't just put up information about it being three inches wide. They actually put up a window that is three inches wide. The, the actual material properties themselves matter, not as semiotic indicators. So I don't think information processing is is wide enough to deal with computing. I don't think the notions of semantic information are true of the kinds of information on the net, because these notions all require notions of proper function and notions of veridicality and a variety of other things. The quantitative notion may be relevant to the physics, but it doesn't deal with the, with the meaningfulness. So it's all kind of a mess. What's going on, I think, is the following. Both the semantic notion, I believe, and the quantitative notion are intellectual attempts of people to deal with the fact that the world has relational coherence. It's not just local. And just as I think now dynamicists laugh at the first half of the 20th century about just looking at linear dynamics, because that's such a small case compared to dynamics full bore, I actually think the 22nd century will laugh at the 20th century for having been looking at physics as just the local bumping and shoving, basically, without dealing with the issues of, of non-local coherence, which is just, I think, of enormous importance to any notion of meaning. I think you can see that in quantum entanglement. I think you can see that in notions of semantic information. I think the quantitative measure is, to some extent, a measure of non-local coherence but they're trying to reduce it to a, to a local property that the Higgs boson passes to the fermions and, 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 and other bosons and so on. So I think there is a background notion, a theme, that underwrites these. And I think the relationality of the world, the non-randomness of the world, is important to computing, but this is not going to work as a theory. Um, and digitality, I'm not going to say anything about it, except this. So John Hoagland, an old friend of mine, um, who passed away, had this wonderful quote. He said, digitality is an engineering notion, root and branch. It's a method for coping with the vagaries and vicissitudes, the noise and drift of earthly existence. Kind of a biblical um, reference. What I think is right about that is that I think digitality, which is an extraordinarily interesting metaphysical notion. Very poorly theorized, interestingly enough. There's very little philosophy of digitality. What I think is powerful is Hoagland recognized, which is implementing something digitally is a fabulous way of providing insurance against the mess of the world below. But the minute you implement something digitally, it's quite good to implement continuity on top of it again. And in fact, if you look at a lot of computer science, it's basically attempting to get rid of the digitality up here. So I think what's, what is right about digitality is a notion of things being digitally implemented. I don't think it's a theory of computing for two reasons. One is I don't think computational phenomena at the level that we care about them. Why is the world changing? How is this affecting our conception of people and our place in the universe and, and all of that kind of stuff? I don't think at that level computation is interestingly digital. Number two, I don't think you can define computation digitally. 
what I think you want to say is why is digital computation such a powerful notion of computation? And I think it is a powerful kind of computation to implement it digitally. But in order to do that, you have to have a notion of computation which is not itself digital or else the thing just becomes a tautology. So I don't think that's right. So they're not right. They're all wrong. Um, okay, so I feel a little bit like Jules Verne around the world in 80 seconds. Um, but uh, <laughs> so what's going on? Well, I still want to say something that's wrong with these in general. But in order to say what's wrong with them in general, I think we have to understand something that is actually true of computation as opposed to something false of computation. And that is actually already up here. Um, first of all, I believe I would be prepared to go to court to argue this. I mean, there are certainly people who, who deny it. So, so, um, so I want to, to, to be clear about admitting that, that this is not universally agreed. But I believe that computation is fundamentally a meaningful, intentional, semantic, interpretive um, phenomenon. That issues of interpretation, semantics, intentional directedness, whatever it is, however, whatever your favorite characterization of intentional phenomena, I think is actually true of this thing. That's one thing I think. What I, and I actually think computers are in, in, in one sense mechanism, in the sense that they're the kind of mechanism that mechanism is recognized in the formal symbol manipulation view in spite of all of its problems, which is that it's mechanisms that honor the intentional stuff. Of all the possible machines you could build, the ones that are computers, I believe, are those that are sort of dynamic, dynamic mechanisms that make semantic intentional sense. So I'm going to characterize that as an interplay of meaning and mechanism. Um, interplay isn't the right word because, for lots of reasons. But anyway, basically that any account of computation has to deal with their meaningful aspects and it has to deal with their mechanical aspects. I think dealing with mechanical aspects is something that computer science has a lot of understanding of because it can build this stuff all the way up from transistors, but somehow these things interplay. Now, what I think is wrong with all of these accounts in general, as opposed to what's wrong with them in particular, is that they have one or two, one or both of two failures. They're radically too narrow. So for example, the formal symbol manipulation thing, this idea that there are symbols and the world is ontologically discrete the way uh, Dreyfus doesn't like and Heidegger wouldn't like. Um, Microsoft Word doesn't deal with the world that way. Microsoft Word, you know, when you write a program, you write the program in symbols. But then you compile it and you end up with this bit strings and stuff and the symbols are part of the programming language. They're not part of the process specified in the programming language. And I think to think from the fact that the program is written in words that the process that results in written words is about as wrong-headed as thinking that just because I can come up with a CAD diagram for a Renault car, and on the CAD diagram are all these symbols, that therefore cars run on symbols. They don't run on symbols. The symbols were used to specify the car. And I think, in fact, most of the symbols in computer science are used to specify computations that are not actually constituents of the computation. For that reason, I think the formal symbol population thing is radically too narrow, not only for the mind, but for computers in general. A lot of these things are radically too narrow. Information is, I think, a radically too narrow conception of the ways in which computers are meaningful. Or else, they, they only deal with one aspect. So I think the theory of effective computability could actually be used for all devices, meaningful or not meaningful. So it only deals with that, but it doesn't deal with the meaningful aspects, so therefore it's not right. 
That's not adequate to the notion of computation. So they fail in that way. So what's right? Well, here's the problem. In order for there to be a theory of computing, which is what I started looking for in 67, I believe it, a theory of computing would have to do two things. First of all, it has to deal with this thing. It would have to be a theory of mechanism and a theory of intentionality and how it is that, it, that, that we're not dualists, how it is that materially embodied intentionality can actually arise in a physically constituted material substrate. And, so that's hard, of course. It would also have to say how computers are special. Because if computers are going to be a subject matter, if the notion computational is going to have any bite as an intellectual notion, for example, if I'm going to say that I'm going to embrace the computational theory of mind, The computational theory of mind is not supposed to be obvious. It's not supposed to be obvious if you're not a Cartesian dualist, that therefore you believe in the computational theory of mind. If, but presumably, if you're not a Cartesian dualist, you believe that your mind is in some sense, or your body, or you embedded in society, or you historically embodied in stuff in a material world, you know, or society itself, or whatever, religious practices involve an interplay of meaning and mechanism, right? That's kind of obvious if you're not a dualist. In order for there to be a notion of computation, it has to say something about the particular kind of interplay of meaning and mechanism that computers are. And my belief is there isn't any such theory. That, you know when Humphrey Bogart was asked about the waters in Casablanca and somebody says to him, what waters? And he says, I, I came for the waters. Somebody says there's no waters in Casablanca. And he says, I was misinformed. My feeling is that we were misinformed. There's no such, there's no, nothing special about computation. It just is this as, oops, as best we can do it, right? We are trying to construct the best systems that in fact we can build, that we know how to build mechanically all the way down through the bottom, that we can actually build up in such a way as to, in fact, demonstrate and exemplify and participate in and extend and so on and so forth our intentional practices. We had books, of course, in writing. Those were pretty substantial invention, but those were pretty passive. We kind of put a battery behind a book and we got activity and we're just dining out on the power of meaningful mechanisms, of which we're instances. So I don't think that Another possibility, when the MIT AI lab builds an intelligent device, and Alexandra is in an um, existential crisis as to whether this device is a machine anymore, I think nobody should be in an existential crisis about whether it's a computer anymore. Because I don't think it being a computer has really says anything. OK, so now you might think, <coughs> you might think that that's a pretty negative conclusion. So when I went off as a 16-year-old to figure out what computation was and spent 50, 40, what is it, 45 years figuring out that I might have wasted my life if my answer is, well, actually there's nothing. <laughs> but I actually think that the fact that there's not going to be a theory of computation, remember at the beginning I made a big deal distinguishing computing from the theory of computing. The fact that there's not going to be a theory of computing as computing I think makes theories of computing and computing both much more interesting than they would have been if there had been a theory of computing. And the reason is this. <laughs> I 
university. There's lots of things you learn in computer science or AI or various other things. You might learn about implementation. You might learn about architecture. You might learn about notions of modularity. You might learn about forms of naming and identity and, and reference and so on and so forth. You might learn about the ontological profusion of computational entities, for example, the entities on the web. You learn all of this stuff. I teach in a philosophy department, and the philosophy department people will start talking about things like materialism, and reductionism, and supervenience. And a variety of things like that. They've got a certain amount of technical terminology for a variety of things. They also talk about, you know, philosophy of language. You learn about intentions and extensions. And you learn about causal theories of reference and descriptive theories of reference and so on and so forth. And, you know, I realize I, I apologize. I come from an analytic tradition by and large. Right? You learn lots of other things, which you take philosophy in other places. The fact that computation is not special means that this box goes away. There's nothing intellectually that is restricting what it is that computer scientists and people with computational experience actually are developing an understanding of that restricts their understanding to anything less than the full case of meaningful mechanisms. And that means that the philosophical discussions of reductionism and supervenience and type-type reduction, token-token reduction, and all this kind of stuff, and the issues of, of black box abstraction and, and gray box abstraction and, 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 and you know, APIs and modularity and parameter passing and all the kind of stuff are accounts of the same phenomenon of how do you describe a system at one level of abstraction in relationship to the same system at a different level of abstraction. So just this last week I taught um, one of the last classes in my undergraduate course, and I was talking about whether if people were anxious about the exam, they should take Prozac or they should go see a counselor. And they should go see a counselor if what, what was that caused them anxiety was something intelligible at the level of a discursive account, in which case they should lie on a couch. And if what it was that made their anxiety intelligible was actually intelligible at the level of serotonin level, then they should take Prozac. And if it's at some other level, an intermediate brain structure that's not actually accountable to is not actually effable in the, in the, in the, in the non-ineffable sense, right? Can't actually be articulated at the level of discourse, conceptual language, which is so high level, and can't be articulated at the level of these broad chemicals that just bathe the brain. But it's in fact something more specific, they're out of luck. You've got to wait 100 years because we don't actually have a vocabulary or we don't have, we don't have clinicians who can actually deal with the brain below the level of discourse but above the level of things that hold it as a whole. But the point was, I was able to talk to the computer scientists in terms of implementing stuff and talk to the philosophers, I've got a class that's half, a, half of each, and say, look, these are the same understandings that you have. And, okay, so that's the first intellectual consequence of the fact that computation is not special. The second consequence of the fact that computation is not special I think ties in, well, it ties into Alexander's thesis, for example. You're in the spotlight here, inevitably, because you're holding the camera. If you think about physics, mechanics, the kind of mechanics you learned in high school, You have physics labs, and you know you have an inclined plane and a, ball, and a ball that's going down at a certain speed, and it's going at this velocity, and what's, how is it going to, whatever, you got a hypercycloid or something like this. There's a certain account of the world at the level that, in fact, mechanics talks about. And then we have sociology and anthropology and philosophy and so on and so forth, which deal with the structure of society and, and, and religious traditions and and enormous politics and, and enormously rich 
and important, I mean, I still think, you know, the most important <coughs> stuff. What I think the rise of computing is doing, I mean, it's not the only thing it's doing, but one way to understand it is that it's, if it's giving us a laboratory of middling complexity between Pascal and Heidegger, roughly. When I worked at Xerox, we had copiers with 25 million lines of code in them. That's a fair amount of code for a copier. The brain has 10 to the 11th neurons and 10 to the 14th connections according to the standard mythology. That's a lot more complicated than 25 million, but it's, 25 million is a lot more complicated than five. And what I think is happening is, whereas historically, we've had a kind of convenience of separation between the vocabulary and the conceptual frames and the forms of explanation and the forms of expectation and the senses of ethics and so on and so forth between the level of science and technology and the level of people and society, politics and culture, what I think the arrival of the computing is doing is it's basically opening up a continuum between these things. And interestingly enough, I think it's opening up a continuum in ways that are much more interesting than understanding people. than to actually see whether stick you in an fMRI and see whether certain parts of your brain light up. And why is it a better answer? Because, first of all, it's engaged with us at the level of politics, society, and so on and so forth. But also because caring for the world and, and actually being dedicated to your neighbor, being de dedicated to that that transcends yourself, in fact, is sort of constitutive of intentional directedness in the full-blooded sense. And the neuroscience people, I think, are a priori committed to a mechanical account. And so therefore, I think they represent what the theoretical computer scientists represent, which is the hegemony of a kind of mechanist philosophy from the 17th century, trying to, in fact, take over the human tradition. They're also trying to take over the computational world, theoretically. But what I think is a glimmer of optimism is once we erase that box and recognize that these phenomena are in fact <coughs> meaningful phenomena and that we have to understand them politically, culturally, and so on and so forth, we've got a chance of rescuing the stuff that matters most from the hegemony of a kind of um, pan mechanism that I, that, that, that I, don't, I don't believe in. All right, I should probably stop. I never even got to ontology and metaphysics, but we could talk about that. Um, <laughs> but anyway, my computer timed out, so it must be over. Um, thank you. Thank you.